This week on Kentucky Afield, we're trying our hand at one of the most exciting fishing opportunities in the state. <laughs> Topwater striped bass. Next, we'll make our way to the hatchery and see where Kentucky's striped bass come from. Then, we're improving the land for native wildlife, and we're doing so in a whole new way. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Kentucky Appeal. Every week, Kentucky Appeal brings you features on hunting and fishing across the state. What a nice fish. An opportunity to hopefully get that bird in the lake. Hey, we got another one over here. There he is. Ooh, a nice one, too. Boy, he's healthy. What do we got? <laughs> that was awesome. Got the first help. Barely made it out in the field. Big small mouth. Very nice. Double point. They're in there. There they go. Look at that joker. Woo. <laughs> that's a good one. There. Look at that. Oh, Whoa, this is a good one. That's better than good, Chad. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Afield. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Every year in May, usually at night, the shad spawn starts to take place. And if you can be on the water when those stripers come up and start hitting top water, well, that's a night you'll never forget. Tonight we're down here on Lake Cumberland and I'm here with my good friend, Jared. How you doing? Good, great. You know, we're gonna try to do something tonight that we have done quite a bit and with mixed success, I have to say. Sometimes it's like the greatest night of fishing in your entire life sometimes not so good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of, that's how fishing goes, but this particular way of fishing is a lot of times feast for famine, and that is, it's May, so what's going on this month? Well, we got uh, everything spawning, and you know, tonight, looking at that shad spawn, see if we can uh, uh, take advantage of that. Shad spawn, alewives, this lake has a bunch of alewives, and a lot of people never see an alewife. If, you, if you're ever out in the wintertime and you look at your transducer, you see these massive balls of bait that are, 60, 70, 80, 100 feet deep. There's this little bait fish species and they get about this big. They don't really use the bank any time of the year except for right now. They come to spawn and they do it at night. Well, predator fish follow them up, right? Sure. You know when they're up. And there's a couple of hints. What do, like, how do you know when the shad spa are spawning? For me, it sound like a, take a uh, bowling ball <laughs> and chuck it in the lake. I'm like, what's that over there? And uh, I've heard that before. You, you know, when they blow up on them, the, you know, even the large mouth, small mouth, or the stripers, when they hit, it literally does sound mm -hmm. like you th threw a bowling ball in the water. But you can also hear the shad, can't yeah. you? Flickering and, uh, yeah, you can, and the moonlight, sometimes you'll see them working up on the bank. Spawning. Sometimes you'll even hook them. Yeah. When you're reeling real slow, you'll even hook these, these little alewives, and they'll come up by the thousands and thousands. So before it gets too dark, because we're going to have to run infrared. The craziest thing about these fish is they are light sensitive. The moon's going to be coming up here in a little while and we're going to look for the shaded banks. We're going to fish the darkest territories we can find. But I'll tell you what I'd like to do. Let's go to the bank, even though it's way too early, and make a few casts and kind of demonstrate the technique that we're going to be using tonight. And then from then, we're going to just go do a little bass fishing and, uh, and wait till we start hearing some action. You good with that? I'm great. Let's make it happen. All right. So you can see how close we are to the bank and we're parallel in the bank. Both of us are gonna be fishing off the front of the boat. And the idea here is that you move the bait as slow as you possibly can, as close to the bank as you possibly can. So what we'll be doing is Jared will be casting on the inside and he'll make his cast. And about the time he gets about halfway in, I'm gonna cast out. We're just gonna go down these banks, easing down these banks yo-yo casting out in front of each other. And that's, that's the process, always close to the shore. Now you can see right now, we're both working barely subsurface baits. It all depends on what the fish want. Look at that one right there. <laughs> Brand new one. Dude, that might be the one we need tonight, Chad. <laughs> what are you gonna do? I'm gonna jump on the bank. No. When the tackle stores are closed on your way down here. Right here. Oh, this way, Bob. My way. Right, yeah. 
Shaking a tree, boss. Shaking a tree. Shaking her over here. Shaking a tree, boss. Hey, that's what we've been looking for. It's not a sliver, it's a... Long A? Long A, it's a big one. Big one. There we go. Hey, hey. Hey, we we're not what we used to be, dude. <laughs> Let's not test it. Oh, yes. That's quite the find. That right there might be what puts them in the boat tonight. And it might be the only thing we put in the boat tonight. <laughs> Could be. fish or a yeti throwing rocks off yeah. that island I'm going there. for the yeti because there ain't nothing in the water <laughs> eating. Cloud cover. Perfect. Oh my goodness. Is that on your line? No. I'm right there by it though. Oh golly gee. That's that same one. Where we've heard three or four of them right here. We get many more blow ups that are kind of in the area and we don't get a bite, we need to think about changing lures. Because if we're throwing where fish are feeding, we're not getting bites, then we need to change up. Bone color bait or something on it. Oh, there he is. I got him. Sweet. Fish on. Grab the net. That, that fish just smoked my bait, and I lost him, and you got him. So I got him hooked up? Yep. You ready for him? Yep. Go. Hey, hey, nice little striper. There we go. Nice, he has quick release in the net. I like that. Perfect. Hit spot lock. We got these fish blowing up all around us. That, what, how many have we missed? About so we've missed about four in a row. Finally, the thing sucked it down, and you were able to get a hook in them. You know, we've been throwing a bunch of different colors, and it changes. For whatever reason, we've been throwing uh, blue backs and silvers. And nothing. They're blowing up all around us, but not under our Everywhere. bait. Everywhere. <laughs> we went to a bone color, and we've had about three or four strikes in about five minutes. Yeah. Let's get these lights turned off. Let's get these lures back out, because this bite window might not last forever. There you go. That's probably in that 26-inch uh, range. Yeah. 24, 26-inch. Nice job. Pretty fish. Yes, sir. Ah. Nice job. Oh, here we go. Got him? Yep. All right. Man, I never even heard that one hit. Oh, yeah. You know, we've been hearing them come up and blow up. That one there just all of a sudden just took the rod about out of my hand. Never heard that strike at all. Come on. Another nice one. There you go. Two and what? The last four minutes? Yeah, you know, we fished for three hours, never had a bite, had four bites, changed colors. Yep. Bam. Two in the boat. <laughs> you got an attitude, don't you? They do. Now, here we go. These things fight like crazy. I mean, these are saltwater fish if they weren't here landlocked in Lake Cumberland and they fight like saltwater fish. They're actually really, really good to eat. Oh, but, uh, and, but they fight like a, like a saltwater fish. Look at that. All right, so this end of the board's 22. That was about 24 inches long. All right, hey, maybe we're onto something. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get the lights off and get back after. Guess what? That 1.30, 2 o'clock hour, here we are. I hope we didn't waste all of our bite window casting the wrong color at them. Hey, those two nice. That's good eating right there. I tell you what, I've 
slowed my retrieve down too. That's what I've done almost, yeah, to non-existent, just barely creeping it. I mean, when you think you're reeling it too slow, slow down. It's amazing how slow they want this thing. There we Ooh. go. Is that you? Yep. You got him? Yeah. I heard him slap. Good one? Yeah. Yeah, it's the best one yet, I believe. Oh my, yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> You're not having any fun, are you? You got something real here now. You are not having any fun yet. Get us out of here, out of the Yeah, the take him out there deep of water. We ain't no hurry. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, boy. They're all about the same size. These are all probably the same year class fish. Look at there. Hard fighting. I, it's hard to describe how fight, how hard they fight. I mean, when you go, okay, that's a five pound fish. Oh, I've got a lot of five pound large mouth. Yeah, it ain't the same game, is it? Yeah, it's nice. Wow, nice fish. So dude. that's the third keeper in seven minutes? Yeah, so now the limit is two per angler. So all right, let's put this one in. Oh, now, th look at there. This is what we were talking about earlier. Now this fish did not try to eat that bait. That is exactly what is spawning right now. And th this, little, this little fish came up and was trying to spawn with my bait. And every now and then, these little hooks are so sharp, you literally hook them. But that right there is what, what these stripers are eating. About the same size as the bait. And it tried to spawn with it and got hooked. They're on fire right now. A double would be fun. Did you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna fire out just a little off that point. Oh, you got him? You got him. Oh my goodness. He's over here at the bank. You got him? Yeah. Still? Yeah. I don't know, I got him, he's got me. Somebody's got somebody. Something's happening. I don't think this one's as big. Well, that thing just jumped four foot out of the air. You don't normally see stripers jump, but that one there decided it was time to come out and show himself. <laughs> I mean, it just jumped. I thought it was gonna jump on the bank. I got my drag set semi-loose because I've only got 15 pounds on here, so. If we have to horse him around for a little bit, then that'll just be okay. There's another keep. Dude, they're all exactly the same size, same year class. Well, Jared, if we'd have figured this out, we'd been home in bed. <laughs> you know, uh, the crazy thing is, is sometimes you come out here and you get all the other fishing reports and we heard people catching them on blue and black and silver and we came out here and threw that. Yeah. And we heard fish blowing up around us and we casted that bait for Pure. three hours. Yeah. We switched to the bone We've had eight bites, boated four, hooked two others, and now we're done. We yeah. got our limit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and <laughs> we got our limit in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes. Yeah. In 10 minutes. Yep. That was awesome. Every one of these are the same year class fish. So the, I don't know the age of this fish, but believe it or not, this is probably about a three-year-old fish. And like I said, when you start thinking about this fish getting up to 50 pounds and 40 inches long, <laughs> You think you could land one on that on 15 pound test? That's big. You'd have to get out here in this deep water. They'll put this one on the board, but I'm pretty sure this one's gonna keep as well. Probably 25 inches. Mm-hmm. Well, that was fun. You know what? May. Close you can get to the bank, slow as you can pull a top water bait, get your drag set right, and hold on. Yeah. And bring plenty of friends because limited two goes pretty fast when they're biting. <laughs> we got to tell the cameraman to put that thing down and get his two. <laughs> yep. Oh and man. Tonight there's the bait. Tonight it was just this long A, just bone colored long A, nothing special. We got her done. <laughs> we got her done. Thanks hey. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> Let's right. put them up, go get them cleaned up, and get him bad. Let's go. If you have ever caught a striper here in the state of Kentucky, you may be shocked to know that that fish came to Kentucky as a little bitty minnow was raised and released into our waterways for you to catch. I'm here today with Scott Barrett. Scott, how you doing? Doing good. We're here today to talk about stripers. Yeah. Stripers, that's been an interesting topic here in the state of Kentucky. I'll tell you what, they go in several bodies of water, obviously Lake Cumberland being the, mm -hmm. the, the one that gets a good majority of our stripers. 
Tell me the process of what you guys do and how, how do you take a striper? Because it's such a unique fish in the wild. You guys are doing this at a fish hatchery, but that's a fish that spends some of its time in salt water, right? That's right. We have them in one acre ponds. We will start those ponds draining at least 24 hours in advance, and we'll creep the pond down slowly so it gives all the fish time to kind of come down towards the deeper end. And our ponds are, they start out shallow and end up, they, they have a gradual slope down into this catch basin. We'll crack them open, drain them down, and once we get them all down in the, into the kettle there, at that point we can get in with a, with a seine and uh, seine those out. We have uh, a lot of help down there. We have some big tubs like garbage cans, you can imagine. We flip them out of the seine into those cans, and then we have employees carry them up the steps. We have these smaller tanks on our pickup trucks, and they will pour them into there. We have O2 rolling on those tanks and some good clean water. When we get done, we will take those up the hatchery and into our main building there in our tank room. And we got a big pipe that you hook up to the smaller tank that lets us shoot them off into these tanks. We have eight individual concrete runs in the hatchery, so we can shoot them off the truck into those runs. And at that point, we can begin to process them. We'll do sample counts on each individual size and get an idea how many per pound for each size class. That way we can weigh them and put them onto our larger hauling trucks to go out, you know, either that afternoon or the next day a lot of the time. It's an amazing process. When I hear you walking through all the time, effort, and energy of feeding and draining and grading, it's like having a big garden. It is. But it's, uh, it's, you know, your output is uh, is fish. Or fish, yeah. It's Live the same, fish. Same principle. It's farming, but uh, we're raising fish, you know. We've been talking about stripers, striped bass, and uh, priority one is always Lake Cumberland. And that's the area you've been working for how many years now? 17 years now. 17 years. Yep. So how many years have we been stocking Lake Cumberland now? We've been stocking, doing experimental stockings all the way back into the 50s and 60s. What makes Lake Cumberland, you know, like Priority One, such a perfect destination for stripers? So striped bass need a cool, oxygenated water. Um, and, and Lake Cumberland, being as deep as it is, has a lot of cold water available. And so we've got this two-layer fishery where we've got our warm water species, like your, your black bass and, and crappie and bluegill and sunfish. Um, but then we also have a really cold, oxygenated water below that, that we can have a good walleye fishery, a great striped bass fishery. And so that's what makes Cumberland is so awesome, is, is we do have both of those features. So when you guys go to Stockholm, how do you you decide what part of the lake do you have to be near deep water I mean do they do really well the first couple years not be in a certain areas or do you spread them out from dam to headwaters we actually spread them out we have 10 different locations that we stock around Lake Cumberland um, we don't like to put all of our eggs in one basket <laughs> um, so we stock about 50,000 at the 10 different locations so okay. we're doing 500,000 fish um, total in Lake Cumberland each year now okay so three-year-old fish that first one at 500,000, you're, you're talking about these fish are legal, right, at this yes, point? Yes, yes. So any fish, like the fish we stock in 2023, they're going to be legal size going into the end of 2025. Okay. So they, they're very fast growers in Lake Cumberland. Um, it doesn't take them long to, to reach a 22-inch size limit. I really appreciate all your hard, hard work and efforts. We like yeah. doing it. Thank you. You're welcome. Wildlife biologists with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife are always looking for new, effective methods for controlling invasive plants at our wildlife management areas. We're here on Rock Castle River Wildlife Management Area in Pulaski County. The prior land use on this property was strip mining. And during that, especially during the reclamation stage, oftentimes, Landowners will use fast growing species to put back on the landscape. In some instances, especially previously, they've used species that are non-native invasive species. So in June of 2023, we started a fairly extensive invasive species removal project. We rented a dozer and actually spent a month uh, dozing out autumn olive, bush honeysuckle, multiflora rose, and basically just piling up these invasive species. To eliminate or reduce the amount of autumn olives specifically on this property, doing one thing alone is not going to be the answer. We've got to follow that up with other types of management practices. So prescribed fires, another tool that we're using, and then of course this herbicide treatment. And we're trying to adapt, you know, as things evolve and technology is coming along. And so we had the money to go ahead and fund this project to get the helicopter out here, do the aerial spraying. We did 330 acres of that. 
And then we followed that up with 65 acres of the drone treatment out here today. And it's just a really good way to get a good coverage of herbicide across the area. And it's a different technique, something that we haven't done in the past. So we can compare those two practices and just see which one's gonna be the most efficient moving forward. Non-native invasive species are really good at establishing quickly on the landscape. They can reproduce very quickly. They can also spread very rapidly and pretty much cover a landscape and smother out all of the native species. If you don't get every single stitch of root out of that autumn olive, it will re-sprout. So the helicopter coming in, basically what we're doing is we can spray 333 acres fairly quick. We can get a landscape level impact for the habitat and for the local wildlife. So you're talking about a very large impact really quick. Autumn olive is one of the most hardy plants and hard to kill plants out there. And he was able to run that thing with 95 gallons of herbicide in it. And he was treating about 20 to 25 acres at a time. And then he would run that herbicide out, come over, land it on top of the tanker truck, refill it. So we could see it was getting a good coverage of herbicide that's being treated. Herbicide application with a helicopter has allowed us to address multiple acres in the project that we've done this week that would have taken us months on the ground if we were spraying it via tractor or if we were going in and actually cutting those down. So it's much, much more time efficient and then also cost efficient when you look at all the cost that is rolled into there. So helicopter application is definitely something that is going to benefit us at being able to address large acres of this species over time. We're also spraying with a drone, and the drone is actually gonna be uh, used to spray a different type of invasive called Ceresia lespediza. It's more of an herbaceous weed that grows in these poor soils, and what it does is it basically takes over as well. It outcompetes all your native species and, and has zero benefit for wildlife. The drone is going to treat a smaller area, but for situations like this, we had 65 acres here today, we could have never contracted that chopper to come over and do that because it's not worth their time. So drone comes over, they got a 25 gallon tank on it, you know, much smaller than what the chopper is. It's a slower process, but this guy's flying like 13 feet above the vegetation, same setup, he's got a tablet. We can see the transects, he's flying, we keep the herbicide where we want it. And you can see in the video, I mean, he's getting awesome coverage on everything that we're spraying. And so it's another tool in the toolbox for us. If we're treating a smaller area, we can call on the drone to come in and do it. Or if we've got these bigger acreage plots, three, four, 500 acres or more, I think that's at a place, you know, where we want to use the chopper. Not only are we addressing that acreage here on Rock Castle River WMA, but we're also looking to expand this and have done that on some of our WMAs in Eastern Kentucky as well. The landscape is extremely similar and unfortunately it's inundated with these non-native invasive species such as autumn olive and Ceresa lespediza. Next step is we're actually going to come in next week once some of these weeds start dying down and we're going to drill native warm season grasses and forbs. We have a lot of quail in this area and there's not very good nesting cover or escape cover for those quail, which is what you need. So we're going to come back in, plant some native warm season grasses, which acts as their nesting cover and then some forbs as well, which brings in those insects. It allows for good broodering habitat for young poults and it creates great browse for deer as well. So it's kind of a one stop shop. Once we get some native cover on the ground, it's actually going to be a fire tolerant species and it's going to allow us to run some hot fires through this. The thought process is that we're going to be able to set back these invasives over time. That way we can provide better habitat for all of our wildlife species. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. 12-year-old Noah Staggs caught this nice 30-inch blue catfish while fishing in Floyd County. Great fish. Check out these young ladies with this nice mess of bluegill caught from a farm pond in Mason County. Pictured here we have Allison Wells and Delaney England. Congratulations. Here we have Lucas Barnes with his first turkey that he took this year while hunting in Wayne County. Nelson Townsend said this is the biggest crappie he's ever caught in his entire life. This fish was 16 inches long. Nice job. 
Easton Walker is proud to have this nice largemouth bass that he caught while fishing in a farm pond. Congratulations. Liam Carroll, who is eight years old, went fishing with his dad, Jason, on Elkhorn Creek and caught this green sunfish. Nice job. June is a great month to grab a kayak and a fishing pole and do some exploring. I suggest checking out Blue Water Trails at fw.ky.gov for more information or a location close to you. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water. Do you like to fish in Kentucky? Then you'll love the new Fish Boat KY app. Search for new bodies of water, fishing regulations, and fishing reports. You can even save your fishing license. The Fish Boat KY app has all of that and more, all in the palm of your hands. What are you waiting for? Download it from your app store and go plan your next fishing adventure right now.